Join Town Hall Los Angeles as we explore the timeliest issues facing our region with top experts. Ask your questions to those who shape Southern California. We're LA's largest and most established public forum and always remain nonpartisan. In our 80-year history, we've hosted over 5,000 speakers from politics to technology to entertainment. Visit our website to see our upcoming speakers and join as a member for exclusive discounts and events. Your community, your issues, your voice. Hello, I'm Val Zavala. Welcome to Town Hall Los Angeles. Now and then you encounter a person who's been through such hardships you wonder how they are still here. That's the case for Susan Burton. She is not only still here, she is transforming the lives of others, specifically women who come out of prison. Susan Burton grew up in a rough neighborhood in Watts. As a child, she was sexually abused and assaulted. She dropped out of school and had a child at 14. But it was the death of her five-year-old son that pushed her over the edge and into drug addiction. That triggered a series of six prison sentences that spanned 20 years. Finally, at age 46, she found a rehab program in Santa Monica that changed her. She then started a program for women that are coming out of prison. It's called A New Way of Life. It's helped over a thousand women get on their feet. Her remarkable story is told in a book, Becoming Ms. Burton, From Prison to Recovery to Leading the Fight for Incarcerated Women. We'll meet this extraordinary woman in this edition of Town Hall Los Angeles. Susan Burton, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you in our studios. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what does a new way of life do and why is it so crucial for women yeah. coming out of prison? Um, a New Way of Life is a nonprofit located in South LA that provides reentry services for women who are exiting prison and jails. It's really important to have a safety net to uh, help people transition from incarceration back to the community. With my own transition, you know, so many times I was let off a bus downtown, uh, Skid Row, and it was like, make a life from that. And it's impossible to do. So these supports are crucial to stop and recidivism. So they would drop you at the bus station, which is right by Skid Row. Would you have money, a driver's license, social security card? What did you have to or so, a family to go to? No, they have um, uh, $200 that they give you called gate money. And with the gate money, you purchase a ticket from the prison to downtown Los Angeles, Greyhound bus station, and it's to make it from there. No ID, no social security card. And it's sort of like a, a shock, a, a sort of culture shock from incarceration to all of the busyness of the community and life. And although you want to be free, you need supports to actually be able to uh, make that transition a healthy one. You were describing there's people there at the bus station just waiting to prey on women, and they can tell that you're coming out of prison? Yeah, they can tell. You have a box, and on the box you have your... CDC number and everybody knows prison garb. Everybody knows prison clothing. And you stand out like a sore thumb and they're just like people who are just waiting to help you spend your gate money. And get you back into drugs or prostitution yes, or whatever. Yes, yes. It's a very yeah. vulnerable moment. We're going to take a look at a clip from a story that was done about your nonprofit, A New Way of Life. It gives people a little better idea of how it works. Let's take a look nice. at it. And I would go down to the bus station and wait for women to get off the bus. And I'd say, hey girl, I have a house. And if you want a place to come and live, you can have a bed there. I knew hundreds of women that just needed a few months of support to be able to stand on their feet and not return to prison. Since I've opened the doors at A New Way of Life, we've gone from one house to five houses We've helped over a thousand women come back into the community. You know, so much of incarceration starts really early on with trauma, um, with 
terrible circumstances, poverty, yes. that starts in very, very young children. That was the case in your situation. Could you describe that? So, you know, my earliest re memory is counting the uh, palm trees headed up to the uh, state mental hospital, Camarilla State Mental Hospital, mm -hmm. and trying to disappear into the upholstery of the car because I knew the man they were going to pick up, my auntie's boyfriend, he was going to harm me. And I didn't know how to verbalize the harm, but I knew what was happening was not right. And uh, to be clear, he was molesting you. He was molesting me. And you say it was your first memory, so you must have been how old? I, I was like four three. years old. Oh I, you know, very, very little, three, four years old. And I didn't know what, how, or where to take it, but I knew something was wrong. And I stuffed that. And, y you know, I mean, you stuff so much, and then it begins to come up in other ways. And there just should have been some place that I could have taken that um, and many other uh, experiences following that, that I could have been able to work through it to know that I had the experience, but I was not the experience. Was your mother aware of this? I believe she was aware of some of the most. My, my mother was uh, aware of, um, later on there was, there was someone who was molesting me, and I believe my mother was aware of it. That's a different person still. That, that, that's still a different person. Wow. But I think that um, from the culture that my mother came from, for white men to take a black girl was customary. Wow. She came out of Texas. She was born in the 20s. And the, those are the types of experiences that young black girls had, and the community really couldn't do anything about it because of the rampant racism. Um, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I've tried to go back and understand much of my life, and that piece sort of makes sense to me uh, with my mother's experience. And then uh, later on, a gang rape, you got pregnant from that, you had a daughter. Um, then you were, obviously didn't finish school. Right. You got into the whole drug world, correct? Yes, yes. You know, on and on, there was just so much that happened. And, you know, when we talk about incarceration and women that are incarcerated, and we sometimes say second chances. And for many women, it's not a second chance that they get at a new way of life. It is a first chance. And I got that first chance in Santa Monica that was just so different from what um, we received in South LA. And that was the, the moment, the inspiration for me to start a place in South LA that women could come to, a place that would treat them with dignity, with respect, and look at the promise that they held be it that they're supported to uh, dream again and uh, realize that promise and, you know, pay it back into the community and their families. And, you know, that's pretty much what we've uh, been able to establish at A New Way of Life. And while I spearheaded it, Val, there's been so many others that have supported it. So it's not just a one-woman hero. It's been community and individuals, both locally and across the state, that have helped to support the good works mm -hmm. of A New Way of Life. And I'm sure many of the women have had the same kind of pain you've had. The biggest heartache for you was the loss of your five-year-old son. Yes. By He was killed accidentally, but it was a hit by a car driven by an LAPD detective yeah. who didn't stop yeah. even. Yeah. That's really what just made your life tumble. Right. Correct? You know, I had um, taken so much trauma and so much pain, and the loss of my five-year-old son, his name was KK, a lively, little, bubbly, mischievous five-year-old. Walked him over to school, and he was gone. Um, and um, that was just more pain than I could contain, yeah. and that triggered the alcoholism and the drug use, and it was the war on drugs, and they were everywhere in our communities. Uh, and again, there should have been some place I could have went for grief, trauma, uh, anger, rage. I mean, my son was hit, and they never even stopped. 
you know, and, you know, it's like, you know, what do I do with that? This is the police department. How do I, how do I, I can't rally up. He was the hope in your life at that time. He so, was yeah, the hope. Yeah, he was yeah, my little yeah. boy. There were um, some rare, kind moments in prison, which is a tough culture, needless to say, that you remember very specifically. There was one moment when a teacher in prison, you kind of, for the first time, unloaded all these, all this trauma that you'd gone through, and that teacher said something very kind yeah. to you, and it yeah. made a difference. What did she say? It did. So her name was Miss Tucker. And I told Ms. Tucker about the images uh, going through my head as I lay on my bunk at night. I told her about my child. I told her about the rape in my daughter. You know, I told her about childhood experiences. And she turned to me and she said, don't worry about passing my class. You have more than enough to think about. And that was the aha moment that, you know, it seemed like normal what all that had happened in my life, but it was like, I've had a horrible life. That's the first time you actually thought, gee, it wasn't my fault, this is not normal, yeah. I've had a tough life. I've had a tough life, it's horrible because if Miss Tucker says to me, don't worry about passing her class, when she was just the, um, the, the she was a tough teacher. She was a tough teacher. Yeah. She was tough on the yard and she would flunk her entire class. Miss Tucker is finding compassion and empathy for me. That's when I begin the journey of introspect and questioning and uh, talking to people about what had happened in my lifetime. And then eventually you uh, got uh, referred to a, a drug rehab program with the help of your brother's friend? My brother's friend. It wasn't the courts. It wasn't a probation officer. It wasn't anybody in prison. That's the ironic thing. Yeah. It came from a family member who heard of something. Yeah, yeah. And so this was a drug rehab place in Santa Monica. In Santa Monica. Right? And what was that like when you went there? Um, when I went there, they treated me with such dignity and respect. They, um, they, they like put their arms around me or it, it was the first time in my life that I realized I was safe and I could proceed, and they were so well resourced. You know, I got therapy there every week. I got dental services, I got recovery services, clothing, food, and um, I began to learn to set goals. Uh, I began to, I got my 12-step sponsor, and you know, um, I but began to heal. Right, weren't the other clientele also predominantly white, and didn't you, you were beginning to realize, oh my goodness, this is offered to this community. Yes. So, a lot about yeah. Watts in South LA. So it was Santa Monica. It was a um, upper middle class, wealthy community. And, you know, I was the only black girl there. And um, I couldn't understand why this community had so many services. And in South LA, we got handcuffed. We got thrown in jail. Uh, in Santa Monica courts, you got a court card. You were directed to treatment. I was directed to prison over and over and over again. And what I know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a, wasn't a bad person. I was a hurt person. I was a sick person. Mm -hmm. And I needed help. So that's why you started A New Way of Life. And these, tell us what the obstacles are that these women face. So they come out, you, you often literally meet them at the, at the bus station. I meet them at the bus station and sometimes I pick them up from the prison mm -hmm. gates or the jail um, uh, in LA County. And I mean, they need a place to belong. We all need a place to belong. They need housing, food, uh, transportation. Emotional support. Emotional support. Just adjusting to society. You, you're saying yeah. some of them are afraid to just walk around in, on the streets? Well, right? yeah. I mean, you've been in, in solitude in a place where there's no traffic. And the fast pace of the LA streets and freeways um, after being in no traffic can be pretty alarming. So we want to help to support, to cushion that 
uh, entry back into the community. Mm -hmm. um, going into a grocery store after you've shopped from a, a one-page list can be overwhelming. So many choices after, mm -hmm. after having no choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and the women, of course, face a lot of no's. You have one of your chapters is called A Wall of No's. Yes. What, what, what do you mean by that? So you, um, you know, you want to go back to school. You want to get a job. You want to um, reunite with your children. You want housing. And, you know, everybody tells you no. Everybody tells you to fill out an application that has a, uh, a, a question, have you ever been convicted of a felony, and you check that box, and that's the no. Might as well put the application uh, in the trash. Yes, yes. Um, you know, you want to do so many things. Can many times you don't know how. Stamps? Can you you can, can now, can. but up until 2015, people with drug convictions could not even get food stamps when they applied. Um, could you get your children back? It's a real long, arduous journey to really? journey, very long, arduous journey to child reunification. And at a new way of life, we have an attorney specifically to help the women reunite with their children. Because you have to have a solid job, a wage, correct? And yeah, you have to, to have a place for the child to live. You have to uh, take all of these different classes that actually amount to a full-time job. Um, you know, you have um, four-hour visits and six-hour visits and overnight visit, weekend visits, and so forth. So there's a, 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 a six month to a year of qualifying to get your child back. And because you went to prison does not mean you're a bad mom. But every, one, every woman who has uh, gone to prison comes out and she has to prove to the courts that she's a good mom. So um, we're doing all we can to support women to reunite with their children, to help them find jobs, to help them go back to school, uh, get the counseling, the mental health services, and whatever it is they need, they need that they don't recidivate and that they become productive, contributing members of the community. We're going to meet one of those women. Her name is Angela, and she's part of your program, and here's her experience. Take a look. I was locked up for four years. That's a long time. I was happy to be out, but still scared. Because, you know, I guess because we're creatures of habit. And you want to feel secure and safe. They drive you to the uh, bus station and, you know, they give you $200 and they buy your ticket out of your money and put you on a bus. And uh, you're just headed to wherever. And so I arrived downtown L.A., and it was really scary. It was really scary. And I looked like I came from prison, you know. I was dusty looking, you know, with jeans and a paper bag. Everybody knows that you're from prison. They know, just by the way you look, and they know. You get approached by everybody. There were people asking you if you needed a ride, telling you that you look fine. Drug addicts, people living that life, and you know they are. It's so easy to get lured especially if you're scared, and, and I'm gonna be honest, I was scared. And I felt like I was just standing there buck naked. I didn't have any place to go, I really didn't. You are now an activist for prison reform and criminal justice reform. What are your priorities? What, what's the changes you really would like to see? So as a advocate and activist, I'd like to see the full restoration of the civil and human rights of people once they have completed their sentence uh, to not be barred from jobs, to not be um, disqualified from juries, uh, jury service. Many people don't want to do jury service, but I'd like to. I'd like to be able to serve on a jury. Are you able to serve on a jury? No, I am banned mm -hmm. from serving on a jury for the rest of my life. Um, you know, I'd like to see people engaged and educated about the restoration of their, of their ability to vote. Um, so in, in a short, I'd like to see, I fight for the full restoration 
of the civil and human rights of people uh, once they've completed their sentence. Because when they've completed their sentence, supposedly you have paid your debt to society and that should be it. But it seems as though people have to keep paying their debt or yeah. their, you had I, a lovely phrase, your sentence never ends even though you're it out. It never ends. You know, it's like having a, a credit card. You pay off the balance and then the balance keep accruing. How does that happen? What would you do if you paid your credit card completely off and the next month the credit card company told you you had 18% interest? And the interest goes on. And, and on, on and on and on. You can never get back to a normal life. Yeah. yeah. 20 years ago when you were getting out of prison, did you ever imagine that you would be the Harvard citizen activist wardie, <laughs> one of the top 10 CNN heroes of 2010, the Purpose Prize winner from AERP? You've been called <laughs> the Harriet Tubman of our day, you know, the famous abolitionist who saved dozens of slaves. Could you have imagined that all this would have happened to you in, what, less than 20 years? No, I, I, um, I didn't imagine when I started a new way of life and I was meeting people, meeting women getting off the bus downtown Skid Row. All I knew is that women needed a safe place to go and they should have a safe place to go. Uh, I didn't know that I would be held up um, and awarded for the contributions that I've made. Um, yeah, I, I, had, I had no idea. How did you afford that first house, especially in Los Angeles, the house that the yeah. women live in? How did that come about? So I came out of the treatment facility in Santa Monica and got a minimum wage job helping this um, lady named Miss Andrews, helping seniors in the community. And she asked me to move in with her, and that afforded me to save all my money. And um, I saved about $12,000, bought a little car for about $1,500, and put a down payment on a little house. And that was the house that welcomed women back into the community that was the birthing of a new way of life. At that time, it was not an official nonprofit, no, correct? No, it was not a nonprofit. It was just my house. And you got on a little shaky financial ground there for a little bit until someone said, oh, you need to become a nonprofit. Yes, yes. Um, First AME Church said, I'll, oh, okay. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you bus tokens if you become a nonprofit. And I'm like, okay, bus tokens will help because we need to get around town. Uh, and then um, other people, you know, begin to support the work in different ways from in-kind contributions to, um, to dollars, and uh, we grew from there. Mm -hmm. So now there's five houses. You know, over a thousand women have been through the doors. Um, What's the recidivism rate? The re recidivism rate uh, hovers at around 85, 90 percent success rate. Success rate. Success people rate. Who do not so re people that people who do not reoffend, people get their children back, become parents, go to school, go to work, and it just goes to show if we put a little bit more resources toward um, supports and in, instead of incarceration and towards rehabilitation instead of punishment, we'd be, we'd be much further ahead. It's expensive and putting people in prison. It is, $75,000 a year. It costs $18,000 a year for a woman to go through a new way of life. And she's much better off at the end of the year than uh, people walking out of the prison gates. People also have to realize that the early childhood trauma, which happens a lot in, in poor uh, yes. communities. Yes. It happens everywhere, but especially in poor communities. Yeah, I think it happens across communities, but some communities are more resourced to be able to address it early on than other than other communities. So it bubbles up and comes out in, in other ways. So if you get these women, these mothers, back on their feet, and they have healthy relationships with their children, you are also minimizing the chance of further childhood trauma and the whole cycle starting. We're, we're stopping. It just makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and and we're stopping the payment of children in the in the uh, uh, foster care, foster foster care system. system. Mm -hmm. We're repairing connections and family, and um, I think it's just it's just a really smarter investment. Mm -hmm. Well, Susan Burton, you've made an amazing difference. Thank you so much for joining us on Town Hall. It's been really great being here uh, at KCET. Thank you.
For more information on today's episode and the series, go online to kcet.org slash townhall. I'm Val Zavala. Thanks for watching. Funding of this presentation is made possible by OUE Limited, the Amundsen Foundation, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, OUE Sky Space LA, an open air observation deck in California, and it's right here in the heart of downtown LA. It's a multimedia experience that celebrates all things LA. Our all-glass sky slide lets you slide nearly 1,000 feet above LA for a 360-degree view of the city. Tickets can be purchased now at oue-skyspace.com. At the Weingart Foundation, we are driven by our long-term commitment to advancing fairness, inclusion, and opportunity for all Southern Californians. Our goal is to strengthen the effectiveness of community organizations as they lead the way forward. For over a century, the California Community Foundation has worked to transform generosity into impact, leading positive change that strengthens Los Angeles. We envision a future where all Angelinos have the opportunity to contribute to the well-being of our region. At Chevron, energy is at the heart of everything we do. We strive to produce safe, reliable energy alternatives now and for the future. The California Endowment is building a movement across our state. We call it Building Healthy Communities. Together, residents, community groups, and organizations are working to make neighborhoods safer and schools better to improve the health of all Californians.